Today is October 8th, 2024, and my name is Jennifer Gray Thompson. I'm the founder and CEO of After the Fire. After the Fire was born in the midst of our fires in 2017, when our entire worlds changed. We lost 8,900 structures and 43 people died. Our fires burned across four counties, Napa, Lake, Sonoma, and Mendocino. It burned for 20 three days and it was unimaginable the scale and the time and the destruction and it really required that all of us sort of work together to get this done that's why rebuild north bay foundation our parent company was actually founded on october 11th by a group of really uh, wonderful high-powered leaders um, from across the counties but primarily napa and sonoma to really see how we could show up for our community we never anticipated this would open up an era of megafire. But it did. So what's happened since then? Since 2017, 35 million acres have burned in the United States. 70,000 structures have been destroyed. Our land management has pivoted, but it's still pretty far behind. And we don't really know the health outcomes from wildfire smoke because we've only been looking at this since 2017 with any kind of seriousness. What is a megafire? Well, it used to be that megafires were thought of as being over 100,000 acres. They didn't often destroy entire towns. But in our case, they've really been redefined by National Geographic in particular as being hot, fast, highly destructive fires that have an outsized impact on the land and the people affected. What is the state of disaster in America? I know this is on our minds a lot right now, considering what we are watching unfold on the East Coast with Hurricane Helene, and today is the day we expect her, the Hurricane Milton to touch down. Well, here's giving you some perspective. In over a 10 year period, 2014 to 2024, we had 173 or more billion dollar events, over $1.2 trillion. In 2023, we had 28 climate based disasters and we had the Maui fires, which was the worst mega fire disaster in 100 years. 102 people died. And the cost is 5.5 billion. And that's just the initial cost. That actually doesn't encompass everything else, including the global settlement that looks like it's incoming for about $4 billion. In 2024, we've already had 63 federally declared disasters. And that number is from October 1st, 2024. We know we're going to have more. Hurricane Helene has, at that time when I wrote this on October 1st, over 150 people had died that were confirmed and we expect that number to even quadruple. The cost will be between 15 billion and 34 billion, but it's also possible we'll go as high as 110 billion. Now that number is a little bit scary, but then when you think about it, last year we spent about $900 billion on defense alone. So if you think about that, we can actually reinvest in our communities and ensure that people get home a little safer and a lot more resilient. So after the fire became after the fire in 2021 officially, but we started looking at this in 2020, we began working in more fires. Previously, we were working in the campfire, the Woolsey fire, helping with Kincaid and Wallbridge. But then in 2020, everything sort of changed in the middle of COVID and we had to figure out how do we serve in other places and in other uh, states and counties safely and we rented an RV my husband drove uh, we took our dogs and then we went on the road to see who we could help and how we could help and also what we could learn from them in the way of what best practices were being done on the ground in other places but most of all we were out we really wanted to build community which we've been very successful So we operate off of the premise of everything that we learned here, including what do you need and how can we help? That's the most important thing when we walk into any community is to really keep the survivor community at the center of our work, which means that 
sure, we may know a lot, but what we have to do is to walk in there and actually listen to the people affected, the people on the front lines. And we never, ever assume that we know everything and that we have nothing to learn. In fact, it is the opposite. We walk in with an open mind, knowing that we are going to learn from the people that we are serving and that we do have something to offer, especially around looking around the corner to see what might be next. We advise, we deploy, we advocate, we educate, and we convene and network. Really important. About two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we had um, people from virtually every Megafire community in the United States come out to Sonoma for a three-day summit to learn from each other and build connection. So in our advising for hard and soft infrastructure, you know, we also lean on our partners. We've had a long-term partnership with CAL FIRE, and we just actually transferred that. But this is a photo with of Paul Duncan in amazing Lake County. I think CAL FIRE LNU, I might be prejudiced, but I think they're sort of in my brain, the superheroes of CAL FIRE, what they cover, the work that they've been doing since 2015 in the Valley Fire is truly impressive. This is Paul Duncan, a Lake County resident, and he also works with Mike Wink. Um, these are wonderful, wonderful public servants. And I just have to shout out to them as I'm also saying, we're happy to advise, but we also take advice from these professionals. We work with IBHS and they have wildfire prepared home. This is actually um, taken at their research facility in Richburg, South Carolina. And they know, we know things can be done for Megafire. You do not have to, entire towns do not have to burn down. It's true that it's not the type of fire that you can often successfully fight in order to stop once it gets going. But there are things we can do to really mitigate the loss and the risk. Another thing we do is that we work a lot with Congress. You know, what do they need and how can we help them better understand what it means to undergo a mega fire as a community? In this case, last year, uh, I testified in front of the Senate subcommittee that oversees um, HUD grants. And we talked about how important it is that Congress move quickly in order to provide relief to communities and not wait and wait and wait. For example, we are now Mm, uh, 14 months post disaster in Maui, and they still do not have their appropriation for their HUD grants, which will help them rebuild. I also sit on a task force making recommendations to Congress on changes that we need to make, um, you know, at the federal level to make the process of recovery for both counties, for counties and states, that's through public assistance, and then through. Um, the uh, individual assistance, how can we make this system make more sense to people, be easier to navigate, um, be less prone to do rejections and require multiple appeals, all of these things. There are more people on the task force than this. Um, so I do encourage you to go to Bipartisan Policy Center and see who's on this task force. And uh, go ahead and send me a note if you have any thoughts about that. I'm very honored to be a part of this group. We deploy, this is probably one of the most of the most important thing that we do. We actually pick people who we know are good, you know, ethical fire leaders uh, or some, or run a nonprofit that we think is super effective. And then we walk into other communities with them where we can sit down and bring specialized knowledge, but also learn more about the challenges that they're facing. In this one photo alone, we have um, Valerie Brown, who I love from United Policyholders. We have Jolie Wills, who's a disaster leader, a mental health um, professional. We have Fannie Mae. Uh, we have Smart Home America. We have IBHS. We have Bipartisan Policy Center. We have COCO, which is a, a, it's a nonprofit based in Colorado. And we're standing with rebuilders and fire leaders from uh, Boulder County, from the Marshall Fire. This is Tanya's house. We also work in, you know, still across um, California. Here is a leader from uh, Bonnie Dune in Santa Cruz. And this was a meeting that we were sitting down and having during COVID.
This is a month after uh, the Dixie Fire was... Um, the, the Dixie Fire actually burned for 105 days. The first time we went up was at the request of one of the local leaders, Ken Donnell, and we also got to meet Supervisor Kevin Goss. Uh, we went on August 12th the first time, and that was four days after um, they called They called me on August 8th, four days after Greenville burned down. That's a total destruction fire. It's a very rural frontier community full of really incredible people. And this, I brought some people up there so we could just sit and really talk to the community about what their concerns are. Um, and I just wanted to point out that we will... It's really important that we walk into communities and not just zoom it out or be far away. This was last December in Hawaii. Um, we waited longer to go in because it wasn't appropriate for us to go in any earlier. The issue with Maui is it's is everybody was so interested in that fire that a lot of people rushed in very, very early. And um, because we are not first responders, we felt it was not the right place for us to go right away, but we started helping from afar with Senator Hirono's office. And then in December, we arranged for this group of very talented people to come with us. So we have um, people from who used to run parts of HUD, people who used to run parts of FEMA, um, to our director of building here in Sonoma County, Tennis Wick, to the former associate director of Texas GLO, they run all the FEMA programs in Texas. We've got leaders from the Marshall Fire, from the Community Foundation. We have Camp Fire school leaders. We have total loss survivors. We've got Jim Alvey, such a superstar, from Good 360. We have Reva Feldman, who is from Malibu. And, you know, with us are two of the leaders that we really love there. We have Alfie from Rebuild um, Maui. We have Nicole, who is just a phenomenal woman from Maui Rapid Response. Part of what we do is we make sure that we actually make way into all of the corners of recovery to figure out who has social capital, who has um, more information about certain demographics, you know, whatever we can do to make sure that we get the entire picture. This was our first of five trips so far, and it was really about learning every single thing that we could. This is the Woolsey fire in 2018, same day as the camp fire. Not everybody is aware of that. And I, this is about um, two months post-disaster, and I'm following around Gary Jones. Uh, you know, full disclosure, Gary Jones is my second cousin, my mother's cousin, and uh, we love him very much. And he and Jean lost their home, but they are about to move home anytime now. They're actually painting the walls. But note that that was 2018. It's now 2024. It took about six years to get home. We would like to shorten that time. Um, it shouldn't take that long. This is one of the prouder moments of my life. Here we are in 2021. This is the Almeida fire in Southern Oregon in Talent. These two little towns, Talent and Phoenix, were totally destroyed by this fire. Um, but the people who care about those towns, they have worked very hard to provide relief for their communities. This was a, an MHP and it lost um, all but 10 units of housing. It was very low income housing. A lot of people paid cash for their units. Um, they lost, I believe, 90 of the 100 homes, 99 of, I might be getting that a little bit wrong. It might be that they lost 100 homes and 99 were not insured and one was insured. Um, but nobody really had insurance in this. It was a total loss. And we're here with uh, Fannie Mae and then the founder of Rebuild Paradise Foundation, Charles. And, and what we're doing is um, we're listening to Mayor Joe tell us about how he feels about the loss of his community. But also we got to learn about some things happening with his landlord that were, you know, really not very uh, fair. And so it was very important that um, whenever we can provide access for survivors of disasters to people who really do have some sort of impact on the national scale, we always take that opportunity and to do that. And so we were really grateful for that moment. Unfortunately, Joe passed away last Last year. This is the CZU Lightning Complex fire. This is up at last chance. This is Gardner um, holding his daughter. 
um, Gardner and Gina are, you know, wonderful fire survivors and they, they lost everything, but their generosity towards the rest of their community is something that um, inspired us when we met them and to this day. Charles Brooks in front of his home. Uh, he was very nice to allow me to see, you know, to bring me in so I could see um, what was going on here. Charles was a, a reusable grocery bag salesman the day before the fire. We met about 12 days after his house burned down and I volunteered him to start a, a Rebuild Paradise Foundation. And I said that I would help. To his credit, he was incredibly great great so good at it that I, I say I always say like the first year I helped him and then after that he just lapped me like he really created programs with his board that listened to the community in front of him that really helps people get home um, everything from a housing plan library to um, you know to, to, to missing middle grants to help people replace their septic tanks things like that things that aren't that sexy but are really important when you've lost everything and I I mean he's now out of the business but I have to say that he should be proud of his legacy for the rest of his life he's a good guy and Rebuild Paradise lives on under the very um, capable uh, leadership of Jen Goodland uh, this is Louisville from the Marshall Fire, and I actually include this because I want people to remember that, you know, whether or not you believe that climate change is real, it, you know, it's in, there's just the facts are there. And, and in this case, in the Marshall Fire, they had had a 10-month drought, and then on December 30th, they got a really warm, hot day with really hot winds, fast winds, and that morning... The fire started, and there's two reasons why it started, but one was they're an energy company. It arced, and it went on to destroy 1,108 homes in about 14, 12 to 14 hours. The next day, a cyclone bomb hit, a snow, I'm sorry, snow cyclone bomb hit, put the fire out, left this destruction behind and when we got there we're actually watching them do debris removal in the snow this is also the first time we ever saw basements um, be affected especially on smaller lots it was really quite a puzzle it's really important that part that you know, you know part of our role is to educate um the country the media um, academics and to work with everybody to understand what a mega fire is, um, how to respond to it, how it's different from wind and rain events, and to be an advocate and a voice for people who entrust our organization to speak for them and with them. And so for that, we do a lot of national media. We will meet them wherever they are. I will, you know, we will interview with anybody from a school newspaper all the way up to Meet the Press, or in this case, CBS News, NBC News, The Washington Post, um, Bloomberg, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. The one thing that we are grateful for is that more and more, there's more attention on the actual needs of megafire communities, uh, what they need, how they recover, where are the gaps. And again, we take this um, position incredibly seriously, and we will always stand up for the rights of fire survivors to be treated with respect and dignity and justice, especially economic justice. Again, we will go, we will talk to um, anybody who wants to talk to us, who wants to learn more about megafires. We're very proud to do that work um, for you. We also do a lot of conferences. Just this year, uh, we spoke at the VOAD. Uh, we were the opening keynote for the VOAD, which is all of the volunteer organizations after disaster. And we also were very honored to go up to Canada at the invitation of the Alberta um, EDA, which was wonderful. Thank you. And we were able to talk to them about megafires. They know about megafires, but they haven't had a lot of total destruction. Notably, in, this was the same province that later lost Jasper. Um, and they're, you know, they are not, they are not 
unfamiliar at all with um, mega fires, but the total destruction of towns has only happened a couple of times there. And so our heart always hurts. And we wish that that wouldn't be the case. But notably, the fires they had the year before are the ones that actually sent the smoke over the United States and into New York and over Washington, D.C., which while we were very sad to see that, there was something that a lot of us shared. It was like, see, now you now you actually can you are experiencing what we experience and it's terrible. We also go to conferences. We do not need to be the main character anywhere. We're very um, honored to be invited by Brooks Nelson to the Walmart conference a couple of years ago. And then we were also at the um, Building Resilience Conference in D.C., put on by the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. It's really important that we look at and we listen to uh, leaders in our field and that we also learn across silos. This is one of the most important things that we can do for and with each other. So we advocate a lot. And, you know, sometimes there's questions about this, like, well, why do you need to do this? But the truth is, is that you have to actually show up in Washington to speak with people, to figure out, um, you know, their points of view, but also to advance the needs and the wishes of megafire survivors. We are unapologetically, you know, fierce in our advocacy of what fire survivors need, want, and deserve. And that also means, though, that we can and will work with um, work with newly fire affected communities in some of these areas. You know, really importantly, and I have to say this over and over again, we are nonpartisan. We do not care. We only care about getting the bill or the desire or the you know, justice for fire survivors. We have a very warm reception and good relationships with uh, senators across the aisle, Congress uh, representatives across the aisle with agencies. It's warm and respectful, but they also understand that we are not going to compromise and that we are not going away. We make sure that they are very clear on our um, very singular focus on helping fire survivors. Here are just more pictures. One of them is from just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Congresswoman Takuda in the corner. Um, she, her, she represents the uh, Lahaina and, and the rest of um, that part of Maui, including Kula, which also experienced the same fires. We went on the congressional exchange up in Paradise with Congresswoman Takuda and Congressman um, LaMalfa, we work a lot with Mike Thompson. He's not in this particular slide, but um, probably primarily Mike Thompson. And then up here with um, Senator Hirono's uh, staff, she represents Hawaii. So we convene, and this is one of the most important things that we do. Anytime we bring frontline fire survivors and frontline workers together and frontline leaders, we know that that is a worthwhile um, mission. We build community every time we do this. And right here in this photo, you see this is from a few weeks ago. We have um, State Senator um, Angus McKelvey. We've got members of Mayor Bisson from Maui, his advisory team. We have uh, Councilwoman uh, Tamara uh, Paulson. She is, represents the county of Maui. We have Supervisor James Gore. And we have two fire survivors who I just adore. Um, the, the Fees, Karen and Brian Fees. He wrote the book, A Fire Story. It's excellent if you have not gotten it. And she is retired from the county of Sonoma. She worked there when I worked there. And even though they lost their home, she stayed up all night and then for many days actually not doing a lot of the coordination to get like kids safe who were in some of the group homes. And she's just a very um, capable person who's done a huge amount for our community and yet probably nobody knows her name. We also have a representative from Lahaina Strong. They've done amazing um, advocacy work um, to really help find some sort of economic and land justice in um, Lahaina in particular. And then we have another person um, from the um, hotel industry, but who's also on the mayor's um, advisory council. And she is a cultural leader in Maui. And so these are very important relationships across the board to have. Oh, sorry, they're standing.
in the rebuilt neighborhood that the fees live in, in Mark West and Santa Rosa. So in our, in our summit, we bring together a variety of people. So my uh, Lorez Bailey is a community leader here in Sonoma County. We had Mayor Bisson, we had the former head of FEMA, we have Supervisor James Gore, but really importantly, we also have people who serve absolute frontline communities um, who had this, you know, really even small, tiny, scrappy nonprofits. You can see a lot of them represented here. This is our Maui delegation. I believe all of them are there. We have people who work at the county, um, all the way to people who run nonprofits, to people who um, help, uh, you know, immigrants after disaster. Just really a huge variety of really um, wonderful work. And it was our honor to actually wrap them into our community and, and make sure that they had connections so that whenever they in their leadership have, need to call somebody that they know exactly that we will connect them and that they're never ever. Ever alone. This work can be very, very lonely. So one of the most important things we do for communities, and we've just heard this over and over again, is that we bring hope. And I would like to say that our fires were so emotionally, um, it was such a hard thing to go through to watch your town and your community burn and burn in a way that was absolutely leveling and devastating and unimaginable. And all of a sudden, you know, you had your life before the fire and then you had your life after the fire. What we learned in our fires is that it's just not true that people turn on each other and turn away and that they hoard things after a fire or after any kind of disaster like we see in Helene. In fact, people do show up for each other. All recoveries are local. All recoveries are built upon trust. That trust is sacred. Disaster communities are sacred. It's the way that they treat each other. It's the absolute baseline of humanity, of what people need. It is completely unacceptable to politicize that at any point, at any time, by any party. To do so is cynical, and it's unkind, and it's inhumane. And so I would like to end this by really saying that unlike cynicism, hopefulness is hard-earned makes demands upon us and can often feel like the most indefensible and lonely place on earth. Hopefulness is not a neutral position either. It is adversarial. It is the warrior emotion that can lay waste to cynicism. It says the world and its inhabitants have value and are worth defending. It says the world is worth believing in. In time we come to find that it is so. And that's from Nick Cave, uh, The Red Hand Files. You can also Google it and watch his interview with Stephen Colbert about a month ago. I highly recommend it. He talks very much about devastation. And in the face of devastation, how do we choose between hopefulness and cynicism? And from afar, if you've never been the victim of a disaster or part of a disaster community, it could feel like it's automatically going to be cynicism. Or you can view it cynically and say, oh, well, you know, this isn't perfect or that isn't perfect. So we cannot, we have to completely exploit um, any of the imperfections in the system, especially for our own gain. Or you can choose to lean in and to listen and to do the work and to honor the actual humanity in action that is definitely taking place on the ground because if you've been part of a disaster community, you absolutely know that human beings are generally very good, that we turn towards each other, we do not turn away. That is what brings us hope. That is what makes it through. It turns out that we are worth defending. It says that the world is worth believing in. And these things are true. And the reason why we are able to do this work seven years later is because what we see every single day in these communities is we see hope. We see people caring for each other. And that is what carries us through, and that is what makes every moment worth it.
we always leave every presentation with the same message, which is that together we can, because together we actually do. If you have any questions about anything I've said here, please do not hesitate to contact me at jennifer at afterthefireusa.org or check us out on any of our socials. You're probably seeing this on a social. We're always happy to talk to you. I really want to thank you for your time.